Are you a socialist if you want good things? Should we regulate big tech? And did Nikki Haley run a perfect race? We'll discuss these questions and more on today's episode of Good Take, Bad Take. Hey friends, welcome to this episode of the Good Take, Bad Take podcast. This is the show where we gather takes that we see on our social media feeds and we critique or we praise them based on our worldviews. My name is Britt and I'm here with my co-host Donnie. Before we get started, make sure to like, share, subscribe, comment. You can find us on Good Take, Bad Take pod and good on Instagram and Good Bad Take pod on Twitter and YouTube. Without further ado, let's get into a few of our takes. So the first one is from the other 98% and it's a Dr. Seuss style meme. Uh, And it's titled, Guess What? You're a Socialist. Do you like your water clean? Do you like your forest green? Do you like the parks you've seen? Guess what? You're a socialist. Want your medicine safe to take? Food that's safe to cook and bake? Your car to stop when you hit your brakes? Guess what? You're a socialist. Want your kids in school today? Or well-made roads to drive away? Or fire trucks and cops to save the day? Guess what? We're all socialists. What do you think, Donnie? This is uh, the biggest straw man you can imagine. So first of all, mo- well, not not all, but most of the things listed here are if you like this thing, you are a socialist, which is just clearly yes. not true. I mean, you could hy- hypothetically, you could like all these things and still say it's not worth socialism if they were if socialism was guaranteed to produce that. Right. In the same way, I could say um, I like this car. But that doesn't mean, oh, guess what? You bought the car. Well, no, I haven't bought the car because I like it, but it doesn't mean it's worth the money exchanged, right? But but of course, the, the the prevailing notion here is that in order for all of these things to exist, to to be realized, you have to fund it through force, through collective uh, taxes, and then requiring government coordination of the marketplace to, to uh, produce these things, which is just crazy for a lot of these let's let's talk about clean water um you know government have had a monopoly on that and then you end up with things like flint michigan right yeah. it's you know and and people will say oh well without without government action you would have infinitely more of that but but that's also just you're trying to prove something a ne- prove a negative there which you which you can't do uh, but i would also say that a lot of the um incentives for all of these things like clean water for safe food and safe medicine, all of these things, the, the market does incentivize that in that when you have competition, when you have private actors, they, they want you to keep buying them. Think about how stupid it would be for a water manufacturer to produce water that makes people sick. That would just that would just be so stupid because it, if it makes them so sick to the point where they die, you've, you're losing your customer base. You're literally killing off your profit. So it just doesn't make sense on a conceptual level. Uh, maybe if you think of the world in sort of a a cartoon characterization of the evil corporate businessman who's you know the the villain in the Muppets movie, like yeah, maybe that guy would want there to be poisoned uh, drinking water or contaminated cleaning water because he doesn't care about the people. But from any realistic assessment of what goes on, that's just not a winning business strategy. It's also just not how most humans operate in terms of most people actually do care about things like that. Um, the other thing is, uh, it. it the memes about like fire trucks and cops. Mm-hmm. Well, fire trucks, you know, firefighters, and as the whole institution originally arose, was a voluntary association. Most firefighters, I don't, I don't think it is in in the current day, but for for the long time, uh, the majority of firefighters were a volunteer firefighting department. Like that got socialized, but it arose out of voluntary action and community coordination based on people taking shifts, people taking payments. Uh, voluntarily for the neighborhood to be protected and safe cops coming to save the day you this is the page that would criticize the cops for being racist and completely discriminatory um in in certain aspects and and now they're praising them in this particular case but when we look at cops a lot of the times they're the monopoly on security but they wouldn't be the only way to have security and the fact that they are a monopoly oftentimes makes them less effective uh look at kenosha <laughs> look look at um any of, of the other blm riots or just the the examples of individuals uh peacefully you know surrendering themselves when they're uh, suspected of something and then cops shooting them there's so many cases of the cops being the monopoly making them worse off than if you had a marketplace for security and things like that. So so even in these examples of like, oh man, you know, these socialized services that are 
specifically created because of the socialized system, uh, they don't hold up to water. This is just throwing in sort of all the nice things that they think a, a civilized society. I mean, in short, this that's what this meme is to say taxes are the price you pay for a civilized society. That's, that's yes. kind of what this meme boils down to um, by by claiming that you could, there's no other way that you could get to to good outcomes in these various areas without forcing people to pay for them, which I just think is demonstrably untrue. Yes. Yeah, it's funny how like there's a selective bias in that people think people would recognize that there are many things that would continue on and be cared about by lots of people, regardless of whether there's some overarching, you know, big brother overseeing it. Uh, but for these sorts of things, it's like, no, 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 like we we have to, you know, no one ca actually cares about this. And it's like, yeah, you know, if you had a uh, you had a business like they have this example, your car to stop when you hit your brakes. It's like, yeah, I, I think every single car manufacturer I've ever known or person that builds a car or the person on the assembly line, it, they definitely just like they're they don't want their cars to stop when 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 you hit your brakes. And it's like it's like, no, like people that build products generally want them to be awesome. <laughs> Right. Like, and here's what's crazy though is even if we grant this assumption that every single person that makes something that puts effort and time and investment into making something that they actually hate their customer and don't want the product that they spent all this time doing and working on to do what it's supposed to do, what they claim it does, even if we grant that, that they're just these big, evil, awful people, like they are still held in check by the consumer because the consumer can choose to not buy that product. And what do you think happens? Like, sure, like the first maybe two or three or 10 or 20 cars that come off the line uh, when they don't stop when you hit the brakes, like people are going to find out about that. And once it comes out that whatever company made this car, uh, their cars don't stop. It's like, yeah, no one's going to buy that car anymore. And it's a big advantage to the car company that does make cars that have brakes that work uh, because then everyone's going to buy those cars. So that's the beauty of the free market is that even you don't actually have to rely on people being altruistic or having the right intentions. And for some reason, people think that if something's socialized or it's managed by the government, that somehow that removes the like the need for people to be altruistic because they've been elected or something. But it's like, no, the same type of uh, problems apply to those people. They, they have motivations that are different than yours. They have uh, competing agendas that might not actually line up with the greater good. Uh, and they are just as bad and as evil as, you know, the worst type of CEO or whatever you want to, you know, make up in your mind about the private sector. But the only difference is, is they have a monopoly on the force uh, to, to take money from you to fund their, you know, their agendas. Uh, and then you can't remove them without convincing all the rest of your people to also vote on it. Uh, and so you can't just actually just be like, hey, I'm going to just take my money elsewhere. It's like, no, you're forced to pay for it until all the other people also decide that they're not going to pay for it. So it's definitely an unethical way um, and uh, of, of doing things. And not only that, but it's also really inefficient. The one thing that I would, you know, kind of like not agree with this on, but it's like, yeah, I don't want my kids in school today. And uh, I'm not particularly fond of, uh, needing the fire trucks and the cops to save the day. I definitely want someone to put out fires, but it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, the socialized fire department. Um, and, and I definitely, you know, like with cops and stuff like that, like they're, they're law enforcement. They enforce the law after it has been broken. They do not uh, prevent crime from happening. Sure, the presence of them might dissuade some sorts of crime, but that is literally in their job description is they enforce it after it's been broken. Uh, they, they don't have a constitutional duty uh, to protect you. Uh, as ruled by the Supreme Court. So, uh, yeah, all the all the things that are awful about, you know, a private monopoly, which doesn't actually exist. And we've talked about that in, in previous episodes, but hypothetically in this person's uh, uh, mind, like it's true of the government, but it has no mechanism of being cleaned out, uh, which is what makes it so bad. Bad outcomes, bad actors uh, and bad scenarios are all, you know, just reality. Um, how you are able to deal with them is really what counts and what is key. And you don't have any mechanism that is time efficient or effective uh, under a socialist society. But in a free market society, at least you do have some say in it. Yeah, the, the last thing I want to I want to say on this one is that I, I kind of got fixated when you were talking uh, and you mentioned, you know, <laughs> like the car car manufacturers want your car to stop when you hit the brakes, right? They want to make something good. And and that got my mind thinking about um, the famous Ralph Nader book, Unsafe at Any Speed, which criticized the Chevrolet Corvair. And it said basically that this car was so unsafe because it would, uh, in certain conditions, you would oversteer and that would make it unsafe. And 
And this is why we need regulations on this kind of stuff. And of course, the public outcry from this was so big that the Corvair basically got canceled and Chevrolet had to shut it down. And the great thing is they, there was a big study done that highlighted that the Corvair actually was not less safe in the conditions that would make cause you to oversteer. This was all complete nonsense. It was projection from one person that ended up causing the industry to put in all these strenuous regulations and things. And it was overblown and and not actually based in reality. And that's one of the, the dangers of thinking that these socialist models are effective or, or powerful is because this guy basically said, hey, we need to regulate this. The, the lawmakers churned out all these regulations and all these laws and the root cause that went behind them wasn't even true. So they're over-regulating this. And then you end up with an industry that now has so many regulations that, while yes, I agree that safety standards are good to have, I don't think that the government is the best uh, mechan- you know, um, authority to implement these things. Because now, for instance, you have minimum requirements for the widths of your frames for safety. But what that ends up doing is it ends up taking away key visibility points on cars that now manufacturers have to work around. And so what you end up with is less visibility than you did before. So while you might have a marginal improvement in frame stability, you have lost the visibility that would make it more likely for you to get into an accident in the first place. And so as we've been saying for, I think every single episode in the last like 10 weeks, you know, there aren't solutions, there are trade-offs. And that's one of those trade-offs. And it's one of those things where you are now regulated from requiring lower visibility. Whereas as a consumer, you should be able to have that choice to say, look, uh, the the visibility is so much more important to me to, to avoid an accident in the first place than the marginal improvement in structural safety. And of course, structural safety and safety requirements, that is a big selling point to especially families and things like that. So the market has incentives to make sure that yes. cars are safe. Uh, and and when you again when you create these false narratives about oh an unregulated industry like this is going to create the chevrolet corvairs Corvairs, that wasn't even based on anything you end up with regulations that are based on nothing and based on falsehoods and that ends up cascading down the line and of course it is much harder to get rid of bad legislation than it is to enact it in the first place absolutely all right moving to our next one We've got a quote retreat of uh, Rand Paul. Rand Paul writes, uh, he's writing about CNBC's uh, headline, the U.S. national debt is rising by $1 trillion about every 100 days. Rand, Rand Paul writes, Washington's addiction to spending is hurting our economy and currency. It has to stop. Uh, and then uh, uh, an ex-user named Andrew writes, totally Rand. Hey, remember when you voted to give $1.9 trillion in tax cuts to billionaires? which incidentally added 1.9 trillion to the national deficit because we do maybe sit this one out. Does Andrew have a point? Uh, not really. No. The The first thing that you need to remember and consider is the fact that the government is not entitled to your money. And so <laughs> when you are talking about tax cuts, you are talking about restoring money back to individuals who own it. Now, there of course are scummy ways to create tax incentives that benefit some individuals or corporations and and that pay. So I'm not saying all tax cuts are equal or that there cannot be uh, bad action done with tax cuts. I'm not saying that because there certainly can be and, and it's nuanced and you have to an- analyze that. But you also just have to, to recognize the, the, the sheer reality of the fact that actually, believe it or not, a tax cut and a tax uh, or and a tax increase or cutting spending those things are, are adding to spending, for instance. Those things both add to the deficit, but they're not equal. Uh, adding spending is always going to be a less adequate way of handling adding to the deficit, basically. So when we're talking, and, and the other thing is that Rand Paul is not one who's advocated for spending while cutting for tax. So, so if you're going to argue, oh man, you're adding to the deficit too. Yeah, but he's also been arguing for a long time about ways to cut the spending in order to balance this deficit and to reduce the deficit. So he's been doing both. He's not inconsistent. He's not saying, um, wow, they, they have a spending problem. Also, let's cut taxes. And here's all the, you know, um, pork that I want for my state, all, you know, all the additionals, uh, all the extra doodads and, and favors and things that Kentucky will get. That's not been his stance. And so, yeah, you can add to the deficit and that's not great, but it's also like one of those things where, but yeah, we shouldn't, have the spending amounts that we do in order for a tax cut like that 
to add to a deficit. Like you shouldn't even be in that position in the first place. And I think Rand Paul's been very consistent on this. Yeah, yeah it's a good point in new, uh, of nuance that like tax cuts can be like they're, they're just the crony capitalism, and they are as even though it's technically not giving the government as much money or whatever, it really is actually taking money from one place and giving it to another uh, because everyone has had their money taken from them because they're the government's going to collect the money regardless of of whether or not. You know, it, it gives a benefit to to one uh, large entity versus another. And most of the time that price is paid uh, by the little guy, um, as, we're, as we're seeing here. And so, but like, regardless, like uh, that, that point kind of in that clarification aside, like imagine you're like a roommate with someone and they have got, you know, a, a really bad spending problem and they just take out hundreds of thousands of dollars of credit card debt and loans. And uh, they're like, hey, like, because we live together in the same house, like, you need to help me pay for the credit card bill. And you're, you like your friend and everything. So you're like, okay, like maybe you voluntarily do that initially. Uh, and then they continue asking for more and more and more. And eventually it's like you're spending your entire income or 30% of your income every single month on paying for your friend's uh, uh, debt. And you're like, hey man, like you continue to open up new credit cards. Like this is a big problem. Like maybe no, don't do that. Uh, maybe I'm not gonna pay you this anymore and I don't wanna have to do this. He's like, no, like, by you not uh, giving me my money or yeah, that's what they think. But you not giving me my money, like you're making us all go into debt even more. It's like, no, like the problem is obviously not that this person uh, that voluntarily at first uh, gave this money, you know, up to help try and satisfy this is, is now trying to cut back. Uh, it's that you're trying to force them to do it. And you're also using that money in such a way that's irresponsible. Like none of us have ever. None of us of this one trillion dollar deficit, you know, that that happens every hundred days. None of us could give an account of where that is actually being spent. None of the people that have signed that into, uh, you know, effect can give an account of where that's being spent because there's so many people that are have vested interest and are using it for ill-gotten means and ill-gotten gain. And the fact that people now don't have to fund that or have to fund it less uh, is not an injustice. It's actually a good thing, and it should be the signal. Like in in a, in a normal society uh, that these people envision, where everything is balanced, like people choosing to not pay taxes or cutting taxes or not funding the government, uh, it, sh it should be the signal that the government is spending money poorly. Uh, but that's not how it works today. They they can just continue to print money and they tax you through inflation instead of taxing you directly out of your paycheck. Absolutely right. I don't have anything more. Me neither. All right, next one. Uh, we've got uh, an article. It's titled, Lindsey Graham and Elizabeth Warren, We Must Regulate Big Tech. We need a nimble, adaptable new agency with, with the expertise, resources, and authority to rein in the tech giants that control our digital lives. Nobody elected big tech executives to govern anything, let alone the entire digital world. If democracy means anything, it means that leaders on both sides of the aisle must take responsibility for protecting the freedom of the American people from the ever-changing whims of these powerful companies and their unaccountable CEOs. Today, we're stepping up to that challenge with a bipartisan bill to treat big tech the way we treat other industries. What do you think? Is this a good thing that uh, Lindsey Graham and Elizabeth Warren are bipartisan support for this? <laughs> Absolutely not. So uh, as I as I mentioned to you before recording, the reason I brought this take in is because this is an argument that was made. This is an op-ed written, I believe, in the New York Times about a year ago, had to do with some federal legislation happening around then. But it relates heavily to two laws that I think I think they're both from 2021. I know at least one of them is um, that passed in Texas and one in Florida um, that basically restrict what social media companies are and uh, aren't allowed to do. And they would restrict them from being able to indiscriminately or excuse me, not, not indiscriminately discriminate against certain viewpoints by content moderation of certain viewpoints and things like that. And, and the, the two bills have slight differences, but they're fairly wide reaching and wide ranging. And the Supreme Court just heard those two cases against each of those bills uh, this early this week or late last week. I can't remember exactly when. And so this this whole framing of we have to regulate big tech. We can't let them determine, um, you know, what speech is or isn't acceptable. That That's kind of the framing of the arguments for these state laws. And 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 to be fair and to be clear, there are people who I like on the side I'm against on this because I understand the idea of not wanting conservative censored. I think at this point, if you don't think that 
conservatives have been censored by social media companies, I think you're just burying your head in the sand. I think that they have been targeted ideologically sometimes and, and a lot of the time with government pressure, but not always. You know, t Twitter, I think, was very inconsistent in its enforcement of some of its st standard policies. And then the government came in and, and sort of pressured it to enforce it against certain people or certain ways. There was some pushback from Twitter at some points, but regardless of whether it's the heavy hand of government doing it or these social media companies, I think it's fair to acknowledge and to recognize conservative voices have been censored. But the real question is, would these laws or just in general, the idea of regulating big tech, would that create more free speech or would it create less free speech? Because ultimately what I think conservatives and libertarians and just people, uh, civil libertarians, so if you're a liberal progressive who, who cares about free expression of minority viewpoints, if you care about that, you should be against these laws that say that uh, you have to treat all viewpoints equally. Because these particular laws in the net choice case, and generally speaking, they, they tell individuals that they have to treat all viewpoints the same, which is an absurd reality when you think about it. Because that means you can't say, hey, uh, I, we don't want anti-Semitic uh, speech on this platform. Because if you say we don't want anti or we, ha we want, you know, pro-Israel speech, you also say, well, we have to allow anti-Israel speech, which can mean pro-Jew speech to anti-Jew speech. It can mean you can't promote uh, anti-suicide rhetoric without promoting pro, allowing pro-suicide <laughs> rhetoric, which is just an absurdity. And again, whether or not you think, well, that's a ridiculous uh, case and, and, and the states should be able to eliminate, uh, limit that. Well, now, once you've taken that step, you recognize, wait, that's the government, which the First pr Amendment specifically protects from regulating what speech is or isn't allowable, saying which speech is or isn't allowable. So, so you're kind of in a danged if you do, danged if you don't situation, as it were. Because if the laws as currently applied are so wide reaching that you can't have any kind of this reasonable discriminatory um, power for, for these platforms, then you're what you're going to end up having is these platforms say, well, we're just not going to allow anyone to speak on these topics at all. And you end up shutting down the avenues of discussion. If you allow the avenues to remain and allow both heinous viewpoints and reasonable viewpoints first topics, then you're going to, one, chase away advertisers who don't want to be associated with particular content because the laws also prevent shadow banning. They prevent anything that would um, discourage monetization of some content over others. So you, so an advertiser couldn't say, look, I don't want to be associated with anti-Semitic content. Don't put my ads there. You can't do that anymore. So advertisers are going to run from these platforms. You're going to bankrupt the platform, less speech, or you set up uh, litigation concerns for liability when, for instance, uh, someone says like, hey, you promoted this really harmful idea or you discriminated against this idea. And so any kind of dangerous position that the social media companies get in for allowing certain types of speech, they're just going to run from that because they don't want to bear that cost. And so then they're going to shut down all the discourse from that. And so you end up with so much more restricted speech in the name of saving it. So I think that those bills are bad. I think that the idea of regulating big tech, big tech is just a, a phenomenally terrible idea uh, because you get the government's hands involved in the sector that you're telling it you, you want to be treated fair and with, you know, freedom and independence, but the government is not really known for, for those things. Yes. Yeah. It, um, Kind of like we were talking about with one of the, the first takes we did today, you know, people assume because someone's from the government or because they were elected uh, by their constituents that they have altruistic motives and that there's no sort of sense of evil or competing agendas that enters into their mind as they uh, dream up this legislation and want to put it out there. And what they say is what they're going to do. And uh, it reminded me of we did this take a few few weeks ago. Um, about software uh, regulations for import from from foreign countries and stuff like that, and how you how everyone needs to be in compliance with it. And if you actually go look at the actual regulations and and all, regulations with anything, you realize that it's it's almost impossible to set foot outside of your house or even get out of bed in the morning without breaking a law. And it's just a matter of like whether or not the government or some entity within the government chooses to enforce that upon you. And then if you start to realize a little bit further, you're like, oh, okay, like. They make it so that in order to basically just live, uh, you have to break a law. Uh, it means that they want to have the excuse to get at you at any point in time if they so choose. And so with these you know, regulations on big tech, like 
people think like, well, at least then it would be like uniformly enforced across all deals. And like you're talking about like, oh, well, like even if like uh, like they want to have someone it be unbiased towards one way or the other. It's like, no, you're actually going to still have biased content on all of these different platforms. It's just going to be selectively enforced based upon which sort of agenda uh, is in power at the time. Uh, because that's how all regulation is eventually used. It's not actually the the fair or unbiased or you know justice is blind kind of mindset that we would like to think the government has. It really is just like, hey, we need to show me the man and I'll show you the crime, right? And it's it's not a matter of like, oh, we're actually trying to make something good. It's that oh, we're going to figure out which type of things we're going to use to get you because we're we're not we're not making a um. We're not making a case for making the world safer or making it more fair. It's really just a, a baton for them to use to beat someone uh, when they so choose. And that's any of these types of big sle- sweeping legislation that uh, sets up a surveillance state or some sort of uh, you know committee or or thing to dictate how things are supposed to be run are eventually used that way. Uh, and we've seen that increasingly uh, as the power of these folks continues to grow. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I'm hoping I'm going to get his name correct here. I think it's Eugene Volok, I believe. He, I think he said it best when he said, you know, no matter how bad the situation may be in this, you know, like maybe there is uh, monopolistic practices or or, or, a, or a troubling amount, lack of uh, competition in the sphere, but there's, there's no situation, uh, there's no situation so bad that litigation or excuse me, that regulation can't make it worse, you know? And, and so it's, That's good. you know, you can look at the current state and say, yeah, I don't like the way that Twitter censored people pre-Elon. I don't like the way Twitter censors people post-Elon. I don't like the way that Facebook suppressed these stories. But that doesn't mean that the laws that are in place from these states are going to improve the situation. Again, it's that mentality that so many people fall into of, we have to do something. And then the thing that you do ends up making the situation so much worse. And I think that this is what's going to happen if the Supreme Court rules in favor of these conservative states' laws, where conservatives really wanted to do something, and it will end up hurting them so much more. And so, I really hope that even when we recognize that there are not, there's not a necessarily the best setup that ever has been. It's also not a, a problem of continued, uh, forever down the road, will never get fixed uh, status. These platforms, they weren't even big enough to matter only a handful of years ago. And so in a handful of years, this problem might completely sort itself out by some innovation we don't even see coming. And I'm more likely to think that that actually is the case. Now, there are network effects, and I don't want to to downplay that. Like the the concerns that conservatives have about censorship, about um, whether or not they should be treated as common carriers, like there are real concerns. And I think that there are less harmful applications of this law. I would still be against. But for instance, if you narrowed down the, the, the... the law's application to things like WhatsApp or direct messaging within those broader services, it makes a little bit more sense. Again, I'm still, I, I still wouldn't necessarily support the idea that a private company has to comply. But in those cases, it's maybe a little bit closer to what traditional common carriers would be, such as phone lines or uh, trains even. But even those common carriers have rights to moderate unruly content. So even if you think that Facebook needs to be treated as a common carrier, carrier, you have to recognize that moderation ability, for instance, for trains, like trains are allowed to kick off unruly uh, customers. If if they're on there and they're causing a scene, you're actually allowed to remove them and disrupt them. That would be a form of moderation of your your common content, even as a common carrier. And so even within sort of the the, um, existing frameworks of what common carriers are, if you buy the argument that some conservatives are making that social media sites are more like common carriers than, say, newspaper editorials, you have to recognize that even that allows moderation and these laws uh, cut into that and and are problematic from that standpoint as well. All right, we got a Politico article headline. Haley ran, Nikki Haley, the former presidential candidate, Haley ran a near perfect race. She just couldn't figure out Trump. What so what's, think? What, what do you think is the uh, what does nearly perfect mean? <laughs> like, uh, so I, I read through it. So what like it, it basically is saying like, hey, uh, Haley tried various ways of, of dealing with Trump between flattering him, apologizing, chastising him, ignoring him. But voters just like how nasty Trump is. And that's why she lost. 
That's... I just I just love that. Like you ran a near nearly perfect. The only problem is you didn't do the one thing you need to do, which is win. You know, it's like yes, it's like I mean, it's like say you know, it'd be like saying it's not, someone, but not even like, though, man, because she she lost by ton. Oh, oh, totally, totally, not even no, no, close. No, it's wrong. not. It's not like oh, like in the UFC, like we had a fight and. You know, I I lost on one judge's scorecards, but all the other judges thought I might have won. It's like no, like it was unanimous decision. Right. You know, it was a beatdown. It was clear. Well, but but I mean, even then, even it's so funny to me because it's like even if you have a headline where it was a close MMA fight, right? Like it's a one v one, and and essentially when you're coming into a Republican primary with an a previous incumbent, essentially it's a you know, nine v one in a sense. You know, you could you could argue well, Vivek wasn't really against Trump, and and, and you know, Haley and mm -hmm. Christie were somewhat. No, no, screw all that analysis and like and partnerships. When it comes down to it, it was an everyone versus Trump race. That's that's the long and short of it. And so, if you are, if you don't beat Trump, then you don't win. That that can't be near perfect because perfect is beating trump and if you're one it, it'd be like again in an mma fight with really close uh really close scores and things like that but you know in every takedown you know the the prevailing champ always won those and it's like okay it's not a near perfect game if the one thing you have to do which is you know overcoming your one opponent and winning it's not near perfect if you never did that and yes. you never came close um and so it, it is extremely hilarious to see this kind of cope it's also really funny how you describe the article saying you know she tried this tried that try if if for instance if trump had that many different faces they would say oh couldn't find his footing couldn't find his ground always switched up was two-faced was you know couldn't commit to anything but when it's Haley, it's like oh it was near perfect because she tried everything in what scenario is that ever uh you know seen as positive i mean even think about how they analyzed vivek's debate performances you know yeah. the first time oh he was really out uh outspoken and loud the second one oh he tried to apologize to everyone third oh he was calling people out and being hostile he was just switching his faces all around but when Haley does it apparently it's it's near perfect it's yeah it's brilliant it's strategic brilliance yeah the uh i think uh, everything you said is good and i think it's hilarious to anyone with with two brain cells to think about like oh yeah like you ran a perfect race except you didn't even get two steps off of the finish line um <laughs> and, and you didn't finish like that's not that's not a perfect race that's barely even a race in and of itself but i think it also just reveals the like how stuck in time a lot of the you know intelligentsia still are Cause it's like, they're like, Oh my gosh, like how could she not win? She did everything that we think is important, <laughs> but it's like, no, like the general populace has moved on from that. Like we no longer see the plastic veneer as being perfect. Like we've moved on to something else as being what matters and whether it's right, wrong or indifferent. I mean, I'm not trying to make a call on that right now, but like, it's very clear that like there is a big divide between what uh, Politico and everyone else thinks about you know is good or perfect versus what uh the general populace thinks this is also like evident in uh like like rotten tomato scores right like yeah if you, if you look at a, a rotten tomato score and you see a critic like the critics version of the rotten tomatoes if it's really high chances are the audience score is going to be low and same with vice versa if the critic score is low the audience score is generally high and i have the opinion i'll probably like whatever film or show or whatever they're they're rating so it's it, there's a huge huge gap and this is a, a another uh you know grain of sand on the heaping pile uh that demonstrates just how far removed these folks are from from the commonplace person yeah i i don't see in what in what world you even give her campaign um uh i mean i guess the only the only marks which you could give her campaign anything sort of positive is that she didn't bust her out like the DeSantis campaign did. She didn't sure. face plant in that way. And that she uh, ignored reality long enough to stay in beyond anyone else, even when the writing was on the wall, which isn't much of a, a good mark to me. You couldn't even win your home state. The only thing you ever won was DC, which is just embarrassing. I, I don't know. That it's, just, yeah. it doesn't really strike me as a, like a, a campaign where I could say, yeah, well, you know, she didn't do it, but she was almost there. There was no point at which I ever felt like, 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 let me put it this way. When my ballot came in for the, for the Washington primary, I knew it would probably be irrelevant, yeah. but my thought was, I kind of want to vote Vivek just even though he's dropped just, just because, um, 
voting for Trump, I don't really want to vote for Trump, but the margins by which he will beat Nikki Haley might be fun to enjoy. Yes. And this is coming from Washington state, right? And and I will be curious to see how it goes because I think, you know, Washington's Republicans tend to not love Trump, but I, th- I still think he will beat her by margins. Yes. Now, I ended up, full disclosure, I ended up circling Vivek because I'm like, ah, it doesn't matter anyway. But, but, the, but the point was, I was never thinking like, well, I should probably vote for Trump so that he can beat her. It was like, by what margin will he beat her? You know? So there's no point at which her campaign was ever a real threat. No one thought about that unless they were huffing copium and, and seething, you know? Yes. Yeah. Huffing both copium and seething. Yeah. She just, it, it's any sort of performance that she had, like, like I, I remember when tr- when it kind of narrowed down to like Trump and Cruz and uh and Kasich in the two thousand you know fifteen <laughs> oh, and sixteen Kasich. stuff. And it's like I'm pretty sure they outperformed her still like in in that and but no one was saying like oh they ran and they everyone criticized Ted Cruz for the way that he ran his race and how he chose not to address certain things and stuff. Mm-hmm. It's like well he came closer than this near perfect person you know. It's like uh, and it just really shows you like how um uh like just just how in bed she is with the establishment i you and i made fun of her uh twitter post i think a few weeks ago where she she was like trying to say that uh the 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 G, the washington dc establishment wants donald trump to win but we're not gonna let him and then she proceeds to the only place she wins is uh <laughs> is vermont and uh in washington dc <laughs> yeah like they must have gotten confused that establishment that wanted trump to win they 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 circled the wrong bubble well you know it's because uh it's because she was so effective in her campaign she switched all their minds last minute that's all yeah yeah Yeah. oh man good good riddance i hope that it really is good riddance and we don't see any more of her all right moving on to our next one we've got a twitter post it's got (laughs) gandalf the gray and saruman the white from the lord of the rings fellowship of the ring and uh, this person writes, they're both so old. But what's worse, Gandalf's age or Saruman's plan to align himself with the Dark Lord Sauron so he can later overthrow him and gain absolute power over Middle Earth for himself? Uh, for those of you who are not reading between the lines, they're basically saying, like, responding to the criticism that both Trump and Biden are old. Uh, but they're trying to say that, you know, well, Biden's just kind of old. Uh, Trump actually wants to be corrupt and awful. Uh, what do you think? Is this an apt comparison? Wait, I actually did not know they were this was a Trump criticizing tweet because my takeaway was that the age thing was not I thought this was making fun. Wow, I thought this was ironic. I'm sorry, my mind is being blown here that this is such an obtuse take. Okay, so for I can't I can't remember the the news show that it was, but th- there's been in, in recent times there's been a lot of people coming out and saying things like, "Well, you know, conservatives are claiming Biden is old, but they're both old." Um as if that's any level of parody. And so I thought that this was just kind of making fun of that because it's like, yeah, clearly they're not actually equal because you look at Biden and his kind of old is a much different kind of old than say Donald Trump. It'd be like comparing, you know, your, your old, uh, you know, uh, world war two veteran grandfather who still, uh, gets his own groceries to like your, your other grandfather who's maybe in a home and, and, isn't able to feed himself like like there's a difference just because two things two people are old and two two things can be true at once they're both old and also they're not equally capable so i thought this was just highlighting the no. idea that that there's that difference i did not realize this was actually like you know claiming that trump was actually evil so what, what, what's actually interesting is i think this is actually kind of a good take i don't think it's a good take in the way they mean it to be a no good take. it's not <laughs> but the, but it is a good take in that you're saying the too old thing, like there's a substantive, substantive difference in two candidates just because they're both old. Now, the funny thing is, I would take it a step further than him to say, yeah, the substantive dis- difference can be how they act because of their age. It's not just that I care about Joe Biden because he's an octogenarian. Like, I wish we had younger people, but that's that's not really my main complaint. It's not that, you know, it's it'd be like, I would vote for Ron Paul over Kamala Harris, even though Ron Paul is old and Kamala Harris is not right. That's not my main complaint is not the fact that he is an octogenarian and, or, 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 you know, that they're, that they're both old. The, the issue being Biden is old and not able to function because he is old, because he is weak. So yes, there are substantive differences just because they're both old. That's not a valid reason to equalize them. This take just, I guess, imputes these motives onto Trump. 
Yes. But I, but I mean, it's not it's not wrong. It's just wrong about what motives it's imputing to which candidate. Yes. I, yes. I, I I, it, the the reality. If you really wanted a more realistic take, it would have two Saruman's walking next to each other. And right. It's like both are old. Uh, one of them is a little bit more competent, but still wants to overthrow and get everything for himself. And the other is, you know, has dementia and is kind of plain like he's uh, he's this nice, sweet old man, but also is very evil and awful and would love to blow up your children in some desert far away. So uh, it's just always funny to me when people like, like they make comparisons to fiction that are just like, oh, I'm the hero. I'm part of the resistance. I'm part of the rebels. I'm part of, you know, uh, 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 Gondor, whatever. It's like, it's like, okay, like you can try and make those, you know, but like it falls short once you realize that like, oh yeah, both sides are actually evil. We're not, we're not living in a, in a world where, you know, there's, uh, uh, there's a good side and a bad side at the top. It's actually just, the top is usually just bad. Right, all of the people that are elite are bad, have their own motives by virtue of them seeking that office and seeking that position. Uh, it's usually that they have bad, ill gotten motives, and um, they usually have some sort of terrible character trait about them. Um, it's not that there's like it's, it's very much like uh, how people like, like with Taylor Swift. I, I'm assuming you're not a Taylor Swift fan, but like people that are really big Taylor Swift fans, like will like speculate about her personal life and like kind of project their own, like how she would react on to them. It's like, no, these people's motives, they, they have way more in common with each other than either side has in common with the constituents that they claim yeah. to represent. Like they, they are both elites that want to use power for their own personal gain and to cement some form of legacy of regardless of the actual results and whether it helps people or not. Um, so this, this take is like, it's, it's correct. Like, and when it's looked at in the vacuum of this, like, yeah, Gandalf is obviously better than Saruman. Uh, and there is definitely a difference in kind between, like, people being old and people having bad motives. Uh, but when it's applied, you know, the way that this guy does, because he, if you go look at his Threads account, he's very, uh, very anti-Trump. Um, you know, when it's applied that way, it just, it makes no sense. It's like, no, like, it, it, it there, like you're saying, there's a big difference between, you know, my grandfather uh, and my great grandfather suffering dementia versus Joe Biden, you know, suffering dementia. One of them has the power to get me blown up somewhere in the desert. The other could just maybe kind of tell me a story that might not be entirely true. And I kind of ha ha laugh at or, you know, joke with him about uh, they're, they're different in kind. One is very harmful. The other is not. Yeah, I would I would say the the that is the the major weakness of this post is that it fails to recognize that which you said, right? Both of them are are Saruman in a sense, you know. Both of them have that power. Both of them have ill motives. Um and so yeah, like to some degree, it is a choice of determining using your judgment to evaluate which one is more or less harmful, but this one just completely ignores the fact that they are both harmful. And so really if you're picking between them, you are picking between the lesser of two evils, whether or not you agree with that ideology is neither here nor there. That's what you're doing, but you have to recognize they're both evil for yep. it to make any sense and for your evaluation to be any uh, realistic, uh, have any realistic weight to it or, or truth. Uh, moving on to our last one. Uh, so we've got a, a quote retweet um, and it's, it's got a picture of, of Hadrian and, uh, or a statue, a statue bust of Hadrian, a guy holding a sign. Uh, and it, it's right, Hadrian was queer. Uh, and in bullet points, uh, the greatest gay love story in history, uh, or an adult man who molested a 13 year old boy. What did he mean by this? Uh, and then Lewis, uh, Ungit, is that how you say I his last so. name? Uh, he, he quote retweets this writing. People don't realize how mainstream, uh, pe pedastry and pedophilia were prior to the rise of Christianity. The positive effects of Christianity are so widespread even our enemies agree with us on most moral questions. What do you think about what Lewis has to say? I think that's a, a, a great point. Now, I'm not uh, historically versed enough to, to speak specifically to the Hadrian thing, but I think that the, the overarching point that Lewis is making is absolutely clear and true. And one of the, are you familiar with, I mean, you, you've been on the internet a, long, a, a relatively a long time. You're probably at least somewhat familiar with Rat and Link um the youtubers at all maybe maybe you do or don't know no. oh yes i am yes yeah 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 i was gonna say it's it's hard to find anyone who isn't just because they have such an extensive history well they they um 
were both uh, originally like very involved Christian individuals. I mean, like they were like like very very much involved in their churches and stuff. And they they've kind of both had a public uh, deconstructing their faith. Mm. And in one episode, they review they revisit every year talking about it and stuff. Rhett um, talks about how he's like I'm open to it, but. I, I'm just saying that, like, I don't think that Christianity is God made. I think it's man made and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, and I, and I don't have all the answers either. So I'm telling you, don't try to adopt my views because I don't think I'm right either. But we just need to be kind to each other, love everyone. It's not that hard, people. And that struck me with this point, which is so much of his preconception and the preconceptions yeah. he would not attribute to Christianity specifically are they stem from the judeo-christian viewpoint so many things that we take for granted in the western world and in the global world frankly are attributable directly to christian ethics and morals and i and you know and even pre, pre that uh jewish uh traditions and morals too but i would say christian specifically uh because of the radical uh change that that was such a major shock to the system and the world um of christianity and and so a, a lot of the times people will will condemn christians for their their part in things like the slave trade but when you look at it the overwhelming factor in ending the slave trade for instance was christianity it was abolitionists were largely driven by their christian convictions and that was unheard of in in the, in the global world that just did not exist before christians took it upon themselves to oppose this institution that had existed essentially since the foundations of of the earth and so you think about that you think about the, the practices of pedophilia like think about the roman empire just in general that practice the greeks um so many stories of theirs celebrate the sort of pedophilia and and different immoral acts like that and christianity said no like you actually don't get to do that that's not okay and so there's so many presuppositions people have, even from basic ideas that, for instance, like lying is not a virtue and lying to get ahead. That There were a lot of cultures, there are indigenous cultures that would say, actually, like in order to, to get ahead, to be the top dog, betraying people is the most cunning thing you can do. And that's honorable and worthy because you are undercutting, because it shows your wit and your, and your you know, skill in deception. And, and Christianity says, no, actually, those things are not honorable, not laudable, and you should take the least of these and and care for them Th these are radical ideas that are just kind of taken for granted yeah uh, and people don't don't recognize that yeah uh, when i was at the startup and 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 working with this guy uh he had this sun tzu quote uh, and he would always use it when we were talking about stuff and it basically goes that like uh, uh, uh tactics without strategy is just the noise and clamor before battle is lost and you know, we, he mainly used that in relation to like sales related stuff. So like if we had a pipeline and we needed to make say a million dollars or something in sales in a year, uh, and we had a strategy, we had, we had a bunch of tactics and things we were going to do, but we didn't have a strategy that said like, Hey, these are the levers we're going to pull to get to a million dollars. You'd be like, yeah, like you're going to fail, right? You don't actually have a way to get to that million dollars. There's nothing that makes me believe like you're going to do all these types of activities and actions and stuff but you don't actually have a plan that gets you there. And in the same way, like you, what sort of foundation do you have to claim that pedophilia or other lying and betrayal or uh, not dealing honestly with your neighbor or having mercy for someone that is, you know, weaker than you or caring about someone who does not have as much as you, like what foundation do you have that can make you make that claim and actually back it up? Right? Like, and most of us, like you're saying, like they, they just take it for granted like well it's just obvious well it's like no for most of human history that type of thought process was not obvious uh humans lived very much not in that type of way uh they very much lived in the opposite type of way it was kill or be killed take what you can and give nothing back and so we take that for granted and because we because we are not a virtuous people uh people that have chosen virtue because it's the right thing to do uh we've forgotten where it all comes from. And we just think these good things happen regardless of whether or not people act virtuously or not. Um, and you forget to, people forget in, to, to that, like these things of like caring about your neighbor and uh, not lying and, and not doing, engaging in pedophilia and stuff. Like they're built upon other virtues like discipline and hard work and not being lazy and valuing your family and sacrifice. And so as we kind of progressively take out these foundational types of disciplines and types of virtues, 
like eventually we do arrive at these more crazy ones that we w previously, even within the past 20 years, we never would have thought we'd be taking out. Um, you know, when people get on Christians that are orthodox uh, about their viewpoints on something like gay marriage or uh, or things like that. And I remember back in 2008 talking with someone um, and they, they were like, like, well, you know, like people use this slippery slope, slope argument, but it's just not true. Like the worst thing that will happen is gay people will be able to get married or something like that. And it's like, well, now you fast forward, not even that long, right? Like it's only 15, 16, 20, you know, 20 years. Like we're already like way far beyond that, beyond what people were being criticized for being slippery slope, you know, alarmists about. Um, and we've totally destroyed, you know, the foundational understandings that we have about gender and sexuality and the foundational blocks of family that make up a society. Um, and so the the less we like adhere to these virtues and we choose to earn it and build ourselves upon it, the more and more insanity will come. And this isn't anything new, which is what's kind of crazy, right? Like back in the the early 1900s, like people were writing about this. They're like, hey, like Nietzsche was writing, not in the 1900s, but the late 1800s, he was basically saying like, hey, like we had the enlightenment, but we kind of took out a lot of the foundational things. Like, yeah, we discarded them as mystical, uh, but they really are like the thing that holds people together and makes them act morally because they believe that there is a supreme sovereign. Like even the Roman empire or the Roman emperor, even though he's sovereign over all of Rome, like he is, he is subject to something even greater than himself. When we took all these other things away, we also took away that. And we all agree that like that's kind of important that the leader should act in such a way that is not just domineering and destructive and self-serves. Uh, but as we've taken away those foundations, we now no longer have a way to argue for that type of virtue, uh, and it's made us weaker. Yeah. the uh, The other aspect here is that when we're talking about th this lack of foundation that you're you know alluding to, it, it's interesting because. On the one hand, I think that we're seeing the the edges fray, right? So you don't have this common understanding, you don't have this grounding of reality, uh, but you still have the, you know, it's fraying at the edges in these niche cases where you're seeing things like, for instance, the construct of gender falling apart. But you also see again the the bulk uh, default worldview that people hold is in alignment with so many values that Christianity offers, but it's not popular to support those things, and so it makes me think of. Rob Henderson, if you haven't um, heard of him, he's he's a brilliant dude, young guy, and he he wrote about this idea a, a bit and, and was speaking about it a bit ago. He just has a new book coming out. I'm planning on picking up and reading uh, a little bit of his. I think is an autobiography, but but he wrote about this idea about um, a, a luxury ideas. That's what he calls them, and it's this this idea that the people who are often in pa places of privilege and power, so like uh, elites in you know high paying universities because their parents were on the board of some you know dc establishment and so they got into like yale or whatever um all of these individuals that have uh really powerful high places in society they will take the the popular view and espouse that to say oh it's totally okay to be polyamorous and to you know you should totally totally support public schools but then in private they flip on these views and they settle down with one spouse they have a family together and they don't live the, these like wild lifestyles that they espouse. They'll put their kids yeah. in private school. And, and so it's like, on the one hand, people, they will verbally say all of the right things that sort of defray this worldview and this classic um, standard that Christianity has set in so many ways. But when it comes to their own lives, they know what works best and they choose what works best, which are these common values, again, that I think Christianity oftentimes brings into society. And so it's it's very interesting to see that sort of double standard that exists and uh, and how, again, you, you know, when you don't have the, the fundamental understanding of the value Christianity brings and why it's important to root a society in those values, uh, you can you can say, hey, yeah, I'm against this. People should be totally free to live in the most wild and uh, untamed ways and and with the least amount of constraint but then they themselves choose to live by those things because they know that is what works best and that is how society has been stable and operated for hundreds of years with sort of a christian christian ethos and back backing so again i'm not i'm not saying that like you know every person in the state or in the in the country needs to be legislated by the state to be christian but it's also worth considering 
Like maybe we should not just totally reject these ideas because you view them as old fashioned or bigoted and, and understand that, you know, even the views that you find fashionable now are probably in some degree uh, informed by Christian teaching and by Christian influence. And maybe it's worth reexamining these ancient truths for uh, for bigger long time perspective over the course of history and and society today. I totally agree. I don't have any more on this one unless you do. I think that's it. Awesome. Well, friends, thank you so much for hanging out with us. We really appreciate it. And we'll catch you on the next show. Mm-hmm.